Oh, there is a real good reason why we're getting a bad reading. Okay, we've got two socket circuits here, socket circuit there and one across here as well. We don't know if it's downstairs or upstairs sockets, it just says socket. So best thing to do is just plug in our tester and switch one off and see what happens. So I've used this device in other videos. It's a brilliant piece of kit. It simply tells you if the circuit's on or off, but also what it does, it also tells you whether the socket currently is wired correctly or not. Three green lights means we're all good. Most important thing. If the customer's home, just let them know that you're going to turn the power off before you do anything, because if you turn off the Wi-Fi, <laughs> you basically could turn off their whole day. Are you okay if I turn off the power a minute? Yeah, brilliant. If the kids are home, it gets even worse. You turn off the Wi-Fi, it's bad news, bad news. That's the one. Look, our internet connection. Mom! Never mind. At this point now, let's have a little look and see exactly how this is wired. This is a pretty new building, so I just want to have a little look and see exactly what type of wiring we've got behind. All right, so the cable colors we got here, blue is your neutral, brown is your live, green and yellow is the earth. If you have older wiring in your property, you'll find that the neutral colors are actually black instead of blue, and the browns are actually red. Um, that's the only difference. The actual wiring is completely the same. It's just a change in colors. So this is a very important part of the job now, because what I'm going to do is I need to test the circuit. So I'm going to put 250 volts through the circuit. I'm basically looking for any dead shorts or any low resistance readings. Uh, so basically I'll put 250 volts of DC current from my meter straight through the system, through our circuit that we're testing. And that tells me if there's any low readings or anything that could potentially be a problem. This is really where the difference is between a DIYer doing it and an electrician doing it. Look, you know, with what we do, we delve a lot deeper. This is really important at this stage to do because before we mess around with the circuit, we want to know what the current status is. What we don't want to do is add sockets to the system and then find out that there's a problem. Then we don't know if it's a problem with the existing wiring or if it's with something new that we've added to the circuit. Okay, all right. So we get about 20 odd mega ohms. It's an acceptable reading. However, particularly on a, a fairly new building, I'd expect it to be a lot higher. Uh, so I'm just gonna have a little look around and see if something's still plugged in. Couple of things here, we've got the, the boiler here. This could be on its own radial circuit maybe. Not sure at this point, I'm gonna turn it off anyway. That, that disconnects the live and neutral from it. So we're, this will give a false reading on the circuit. So we've disconnected that off. We've also got the garage connected here as well for the spur, which is quite unusual. Um, I'm gonna leave that be just for a minute. Let's go and test again and see if it's cleared up that reading. Right, here's the live again. Mm, nope, it remains the same pretty much. Hmm, interesting, it's still on. Utility is on a different circuit. Power still on in here. So the chances are the kitchen's purely on its own circuit. What I will do is just check upstairs because sometimes they wire the back of the house down and up and then the front of the house down and up on a separate circuit. Ah, so I've got sockets off up here. I'm gonna just wander around the rooms a minute. It's exactly as I thought the rear of the house upstairs is on with the kitchen. So this is a really important part of the process because just because you've turned off a circuit, it doesn't mean everything you expect to be off is off. I've checked to make sure that socket's off, but I don't know whether these sockets are off, just like the utility there is still on at the moment. You'd expect that to be part of the kitchen, which is why this is so important to do this at this point. Oh, there is a real good reason why we're getting a bad reading. <laughs> Look at this. See, the, see the, darkened, the darkened plastic here? Check that out. And now look, you can see the scorch marks on this neutral cable right here. And then look at this actual cable here. You can see here it's scuffed and scagged. Yeah, that's bare copper there. That's bare live cable there. That, oh, look at that. Look at the scorch mark in the back of that box. That's gone bang at some point in the past. Right, so now I'm disconnecting off the load side of the garage. So let's go back and now test it again. Oh, there we go. Readings jump straight up to 200 meg. 200 meg ohms on the live. Let me test the neutral now as well. Earth to neutral. 200 meg. I'm going to do a dead short test now. I'm going to deliberately create a dead short with my meter to prove that my meter is actually reading it accurately. There we go. 0.00. If you've got a true dead short, that's what it'll look like. Basically what I'm doing is checking that the, the ring circuit is a continuous loop because what you've got here is a con consumer unit and a bunch of sockets on that circuit. They're wired as a loop configuration. So you'll have one cable that leaves this consumer unit, goes to the first socket, to the second, all the way around, daisy chains, and then it comes back to create that loop. So I'm checking that we've got a loop here. There we go. 
So now I've proven that the socket circuit is adequate and safe, uh, it's isolated, so we're now ready to start work and start planning things. Brand new, I just bought this, especially for this job. This basically measures the size. If you're using a, a twin box for a, a double socket, uh, you use this as a template. It's got a built-in spirit level. And, or if you're doing a single socket, say for a light switch here, then you use the single one like that. So that's for double and that's for single. Really good piece of kit. If you want one, I'll leave a link in the description. Nice. Nice. So as electricians, we always hope <laughs> that there is enough depth, even though it seems to be deep enough there, the plasterboard could be slightly closer to the wall up here. So we always hope this is our moment of prayer now. Like, please, 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 be deeper. Oh, no, not quite. It's out by, it's out by a couple of millimeters. A little bit deeper that side. Yeah, we are gonna need to chisel a little bit that way. That's not a problem though. Safety first people, obviously protect the eyes, protect the ears. I particularly wanna protect my ears because uh, I do a bit of DJing in my spare time, so I need them for the ones and twos and all that. Yeah. So as a little treat for the customer, what I'm doing is, seeing I'm going to the trouble of cutting in a box, having to increase the depth. I've actually gone for a 35 mil box. And the reason I've done this is because 35 mil boxes are better for fitting USB sockets. So that once this kitchen's all finished, the customer can have a lovely USB socket right here to plug in anything they might need. Guys, for the purpose of this video, we are actually adding more than one socket here. We're actually adding a second one over here. But to keep things simple, we're just gonna concentrate on this one, but we're gonna open the circuit, but the principle remains the same on whether you're adding one socket or whether you're adding many. It is actually on a dab here or a dot, call it a dot or a dab. I never know which one to say, is it dot or dab? Or dot and dab. However, here we go, we have found the cables. So this is the dab, this is the actual dab material. So they splodged it in there and great, it's all straight over the top of the cables. At this point now, I hope, I hope and I pray that when I tug on these cables, they move down here, because it means that there's no more dot or dabs on top, of the, on top of these cables. However, from seeing what I've already seen, I fear that they are glued into the wall, good and proper. No, no movement. So I can see, I've just opened up this bit of wall here, I can see that the dab is right here. So it just misses it, but I do know what they normally do is they normally put, they normally gunk it all up around the actual socket. And the reason they do that is so that when the socket faceplate gets screwed back, it's nice and solid. Because obviously when, the, when this screws back, it clamps back onto the wall. So it's very important that the wall is structurally sound and solid around it. And when you look up, I got movement, which is great. <laughs> There we go. Right, just got to get rid of this. La, la, da. Wah. Perfect. I'm only joking, I was just making sure you guys were awake. The rubbish really went in here, don't you worry. So the main size cables that we normally use in a domestic property are one mil to 1.5 millimeter for uh, lighting cables. And then we use 2.5 millimeter cable for socket circuits. We use six mil typically for cooker circuits. Um, and we use 10 millimeter cable for showers. Showers used to be wired in six mil years ago, but since they've now started making showers more powerful, we now use 10, 10 millimeter cable for those. This cable now we're gonna pull all the way up through the wall. So we're pulling up the old cable and we have the new one joined onto it. This old cable isn't just a pulley. This is important that we actually keep this cable because we need it to complete the circuit. Helps having long arms for this bit as well. So I can pull this straight up the wall. 
doesn't always work out this wonderful. <laughs> Cut that one off there. That is our new cable that's ready to go to there. And you know what I'm going to do for good measure? I'm going to put some slack up in the ceiling as well. So if there's any alterations in future, there's a nice bit of slack up there for things to be moved around. There's no reason why it can't just sit in the ceiling nicely. That'd be a nice little treat for some, for some tradesmen in the future. There we go, there's one. Here is our second one. Beautiful. I've got a new cable down to here. What I'm not going to do though is take it directly to back to this socket box. This socket box is going to be made redundant. I'm going to take this out of the wall in just a moment. The reason being is because there's going to be a big um, double drawer unit here with a desktop running across this bit. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to recess a socket in the, in the rear of it, um, like on the hard backing. And what we're going to do is then there's going to be a fridge freezer next to it. So we'll bring the cable into the back of the unit to plug in. So what I would need to do is just leave a nice bit of slack on this cable. So if the socket needs to be moved left, right, up or down a bit, then there's plenty of slack so that we can fit the socket wherever it needs to be. This becomes like more like surgery when it gets like this. Poking around, poking around in crevices and cavities. Looks like we are gonna have to take out a little bit of wall here. It's not the end of the world though. Something to consider as well is that we must not ever, ever think that it's okay to go from say a point like this and go on a diagonal angle or often any skew of type of angles. Everything must be kept in, a line, in lines. So if you've got a socket here, by regulation, we're allowed to take cables sideways like this and we're allowed to take them up and down like this from this central point here. What we're not allowed to do is go, oh, okay, there's a socket up there. I'll go up here and I'll just go a little bit zigzaggy over here and then up to there. We're not allowed to do that. So that's why it's important. If I can't get a direct line of route across here, I could probably poke from here directly down to here, but that's against regulation. So what I'm gonna do is take out this bit of wall here to make sure I keep everything in alignment with the lines I'm allowed. There's a, there's a, the sockets come out here, so I'm allowed to follow this path, and there's a socket here, so I can have this path and this path joined together in terms of the cable routes. Oh, okay, we've got a cable in the way, that's what's stopping us, that's all right. Just an aerial cable, that one's coming out anyway. So we used to have our existing socket point just here. So what we've done is we've opened up that ring circuit, we've split the two legs that are in here, we sent one over to here and one over to here. So what we've then done is taken two new cables from the two positions where I've got my hands and we've brought them down the wall to here. So by doing that, what we've essentially done is we've just opened up the ring circuit and added more sockets onto the ring. So guys, what's actually gonna happen with these sections of wall? There is a plasterer coming in, so he's gonna put bonding straight in over all these points here. Uh, so all this is gonna be bonded over, like as in these holes, and then it'll all get a lovely fresh skim over the whole thing. So this is the capping. This capping sits over the cables like this. And what it basically does is that it will protect, this will not give mechanical protection once the wall's finished to any screws or nails going through. That's not the purpose of this. This is purely designed so that when the plasterer comes along and he wants to put his bonding in, he's gonna use his trowel or whatever he uses and he's gonna go across like that and the, the tool that he uses potentially has quite a sharp edge on it. So it's important that these cables are protected. What we don't want to happen is the plasterer come along, put his bonding in, slice a cable by accident, and now you've got a damaged cable in the wall which will become a problem on the second fix stage once this kitchen all gets livened up. Right, okay, first things first, I can shorten these cables a little bit. Didn't even quite that long. Now we use our Nipex cable stripper here. There are other methods you can do. You can score a line with an electrician's knife straight down there and, and peel the cable back. Or the other method is people just simply just use a pair of snips like I did earlier in the video. Just use a pair of snips straight down the center of that cable and then pull the earth out and then strip it back and cut it off on this part here. I can bend over the end. I can feel that the copper's there. So I've bent it over like that. I can feel where the end is. I know that I want about that much to stick out the end. So I pull it away, cut it, slide it back. And there we go. We've got our ends doubled over nicely. What is the actual reason why these cables don't come with earth sheathing already on them? Let me know in the comments, guys. It'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. On newer sockets, you always have two earth terminals. So 
This earth goes into this terminal, this side of the socket. Hear that sound? Don't know if you can hear that on the mic, but there's a nice little clicking sound. That's the sound of the, the grip of the screw, really graunching into that cable, but not too much. You want it so it's just making a nice tight fit, but you don't, you, don't, you certainly don't want it loose, but you don't want to over tighten it because you'll crush, crush the copper. And then when you go to push the socket back, it will snap off. Right guys, so that's all connected now. However, I have done something wrong here and I've done it wrong on purpose to see whether you guys could pick up on what it was. So guys, pause the video right now and drop your thoughts in the comments. What is wrong with this socket right now? So did you spot the problem? Yes, we put the live and neutral around the wrong way deliberately here, just to showcase how easy it is just to connect the socket up the wrong way. And this can be a real problem. It can be very unsafe depending on the scenario. To liven it up, we need to do our final checks on the system to make sure everything's safe. So let's go into the dungeon. Check my leads. Okay, I'm gonna do a continuity check on it first just to do the, check the, the lives are all good. 0 0.55. The neutrals, I should get a very similar reading. Oh, it's a bit, there's just a connection here, come on. Yep, 0 0.55, lovely. Now we just need to check to make sure that there are no dead shorts on the circuit from the wiring that we've been doing. We know there wasn't previously, so if we got dead short now, I know that it's only to do with something that we've been wiring since, since we've been doing the work that we're doing. Earth to live, here we go. Over 200 mega ohms. That's a completely clear circuit. That means we, we've got a really good high reading on that. That's, that's really what we are looking for. Okay guys, I've done my ring continuity check again, and I've done my insulation resistance check, and everything is completely as it should be. Uh, so we're ready to get this connected back up and get the power on. Ben, are you clear of the sockets? Yeah. Cool, he's working on the lighting circuit, but regardless of that, you always check to make sure, just to be on the safe side, because you don't get a second chance with some of these things. It's still working as normal. Now let me plug in my handy socket tester just to prove that this socket is wired incorrectly. So it goes to show that sockets can still work even if they're wired incorrectly. The difference being is that this socket may be wired incorrectly and still working, but certain things that you can plug into this socket, could you could potentially damage products that get plugged into it. We've had it before where customers have said to us, well, we've just gone through two microwaves and we can't understand why. And so anyway, when we've gone in and figured out that there's a problem, it's not stopped the microwave from working. However, it's shortened the life expectancy of it. So, <laughs> Big Ben, I don't, owe you a uh, I don't owe you a charger quite yet, <laughs> but if this goes in the next six weeks, then yeah, we know exactly what, what it was. Just to prove that the rest of the circuit is working normally, I we'll come over here. That's, that's how it should have been. And that proves that we have live, neutral and earth ran the correct way. Now from an electrician standpoint, we do a bit more of an advanced test. Not only do we check the polarity, the polarity meaning the connections around the right way. So not only do we check the polarity, uh, we also take a measurement of the actual earth path of this system. 1.02. It's a pretty large socket circuit here, so I expect the readings to be around about that. So yeah, all is good with that. So this video is dedicated to showcase exactly what's involved with adding a socket. It's not as simple as just adding a socket. The expertise required to add that socket is what's vital here. So I dedicate this video to all electricians out there. I also want to say as well that that link I said earlier that would pop up about what can happen if something really fatally goes wrong when adding a socket just like this. Check out the link up here guys and watch that video. It's been a pleasure. I'll see you on the next one. Disclaimer alert guys. Now hold on.